This is Module 6, Introduction to Cellular Respiration and Glucose Metabolism, Part 1. For the remainder of the semester, we will be discussing different metabolic pathways, and we're going to start this discussing aerobic cellular respiration, which proceeds in three stages, the first being glycolysis. For this video, 6-1, I'm going to describe the thermodynamics of all types of metabolic reactions and all pathways, and in general, how these pathways are regulated. In future videos, in future weeks, we'll talk about the specific ways in which each pathway is regulated. Metabolism refers to the sum of all catabolic and anabolic processes. Catabolic or catabolism is the process of using macromolecules to oxidize them to create free energy. Um, another reason, another way that you do catabolism is by breaking down large proteins into smaller building blocks like amino acids. And so there are two routes for catabol catabolic pathway. There's fully oxidize the macromolecule into um, a source of energy to make ATP, or catabolize the macromolecule into building blocks, which you then use to anabolize or build other macromolecules in the body. And so you can imagine a situation where you would start with a protein, um, break it down into an amino acid, and then use those amino acids to build enzymes or hormones and such in the body. You could imagine a situation where you're ingesting um, cellular material and that contains nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. And so you would catabolize those back into nucleotides like um, the A's, T's, G's, and C's of DNA and then use those to build your own DNA for your own cells. Um, and so um, the two most frequently oxidized macromolecules are polysaccharides and triacylglycerols. Typically, those are catabolized and oxidized into a form of free energy that can be used to anabolize ATP, so create ATP from ADP and phosphate. A lot of metabolic processes and pathways happen in the liver. It is the major organ involved in metabolism. Um, it is the powerhouse of the body. If, the, if mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, then the liver is the powerhouse of the body. It helps to um, uh, regulate your blood glucose levels by um, storing, so the liver can store glucose um, as, as glycogen. And so when your blood glucose levels drop, the liver will break down glycogen into glucose and replenish your blood sugar. If your blood sugar goes up, the liver will take it out of the blood, um, as will other organs, but the liver will take it out of the blood and store it as glycogen. And so it is really responsible for regulating blood glucose levels. Um, it also, so and it does so to make sure that there's a constant level of glucose in the blood in order to supply other organs with um, an energy source for creating ATP. Um, so most of the metabolic, actually all of the metabolic pathways that we'll discuss from here on out can take place in the liver. Um, other organs like muscles, heart, or brain um, are restricted to some, but not all, of the metabolic pathways that I'm going to describe for the rest of the semester. Okay, so let's talk about metabolic reactions in general. Metabolic reactions are set up in a series of pathways where the starting material of one reaction um, becomes the product, and then that product becomes the starting material for a second reaction. And so many metabolic reactions are coupled together in pathways. One example of this is glycolysis. Glycolysis takes glucose and turns it into pyruvate, but it doesn't do so in one enzymatic step. It does so in 10 enzymatic steps. And some of these happen spontaneously on their own and at a constant rate. Others happen um, um, Others are referred to as far from equilibrium reactions, where enzymes don't have the catalytic activity to actually accomplish an equilibrium. This is usually because those enzymes are often saturated with substrate or exist in areas of the body where there is always substrate around. And so that means the reaction will always proceed from reactant to product, and the enzymes are not able to catalyze the reverse reaction because they're always saturated with substrate and can therefore not bind product to reverse the reaction. So this means um, if they're often saturated with substrate, they're in the slow part of the binding curve. They're near Vmax for their reaction, their reaction rates. So they're always functioning at Vmax. They're always saturated with substrate. And so they're always moving from substrate to product. 
um, <clears throat> because substrate concentration is always higher than product concentration, these reactions are very exergonic and therefore spontaneous. Of course, they also require the use of the enzymes to speed up the rate of the reaction, but the reaction themselves will proceed spontaneously and are thermodynamically favorable. So how then do we regulate these different steps? For example, in glycolysis, there are three, at least three, far from equilibrium reactions where three of the enzymes in glycolysis are almost always saturated with substrate. And so how do we regulate those steps? How do we increase or decrease the rate of glycolysis if um, three enzymes in the pathway are always pushing towards one end of the equation and not the other? These steps are referred to as rate limiting steps, and they represent different points of regulation in the pathway. And so any of these far from equilibrium enzymes that exist in glycolysis, the three that I'm sort of alluding to, are three very tightly regulated steps in glycolysis. So let's think about what this might look like. Far from, equi far from equilibrium reactions, therefore control the flow of substrates and control the rate of the overall pathway. Um, this is because, again, these enzymes are always saturated with substrate and represent a point where um, the pathway is naturally slowing down um, because, again, those enzymes are functioning at Vmax. Um, increasing substrate in those situations isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to speed up the reaction because they're always saturated with substrate anyway. So far from equilibrium reactions can act like a dam to control the flow of substrates by varying the enzyme's activity. What this means is, Let's say we have, um, so this is the free energy scale right here. So lots of free energy, low free energy. And then we have the metabolic pathway. Um, far from equilibrium reactions are sort of like a dam controlling the flow of intermediates flowing through the pathway. And so if the dam then represents the enzyme, um, the enzyme Act, so the activity of this dam, whether how high it is or how low it is, will control the spill of water over the dam. So if enzyme activity um, is very high, the dam would be low and you would get lots of flow over that dam. If enzyme activity is very low, that means the dam is very high, holding back all of these substrates over here, um, controlling the rate at which they flow down the rest of the metabolic pathway. Um, so again, these types of enzymes are referred to as rate determining steps, and they determine the speed at which the reactions proceed through the pathway. And so while lots of other reactions in the pathway may be near equilibrium and, and occurring at a constant rate, um, the enzymes that are far from equilibrium reactions and constantly saturated with substrate are the ones that actually control the overall rate of the pathway. And so these other, these other reactions don't control um, what's called metabolic flux or flow of metabolites through a pathway. Okay, far from equilibrium reactions therefore have three major consequences. These metabolic pathways are irreversible. So this means in a multi-step pathway, one irreversible step makes the overall pathway flow irreversible. If you have say one, two, three enzymes, but the second one cannot catalyze a reverse reaction, then you can't reverse the entire pathway. Even if enzyme three can reverse it, enzyme two can't, and so you end up going back towards three again. And so again, in a multi-step pathway where these, connect, these reactions are all connected, if one of those steps is irreversible, the overall pathway flow is also irreversible. Again, they control flux through the pathway. Another major consequence of far from equilibrium reactions are that every metabolic pathway will have what's called a committed step. It's not always the first step in the pathway. Um, so a lot of times it is the first step in the pathway, the majority of the time it is, but it isn't always the committed step of the pathway. What this means is, what a committed step is, if you can accomplish that step, if the reaction will proceed through the committed step, it will very likely proceed all the way through the rest of the reactions to the end of the pathway. The third major consequence of a far from equilibrium reaction is that catabolic and anabolic pathways must therefore differ. For example, if a catabolic pathway has one of these irreversible steps and is overall irreversible, then the anabolic pathway is not simply the reversal of those enzymes. You have to kind of 
find a workaround. You have to find a path around this irreversible step. And so if A through B, if A to B is irreversible, then B to A has to happen through a different pathway, through a different enzyme. And so this is sort of describing um, the reverse effects of glycolysis, which turns glucose into pyruvate, and gluconeogenesis, which turns pyruvate into glucose. Like I said, glycolysis is not a reversible pathway. There are three enzymes in glycolysis that represent irreversible steps. Therefore, gluconeogenesis uses some of the same enzymes as glycolysis. It uses all of the near equilibrium reactions, but when it gets to those far from equilibrium reactions, a separate enzyme is required to reverse that step. This allows for independent control and regulation of the forward reaction, glycolysis, and the reverse reaction, gluconeogenesis. So both of them are regulated in different ways because different enzymes, some, some, of the, some of the steps involve different enzymes. What I've been sort of getting at is when I keep saying flow of metabolites through a pathway or um, can, like um, the spill of water over that dam, all of that is referring to this concept of metabolic flux, which refers to how quickly metabolites flow through a pathway. So how quickly can we turn glucose into glucose 6-phosphate? How quickly can then glucose 6-phosphate be turned into the next step, and then the third step, and then the fourth step until we get to pyruvate? And so the flux of intermediates through glycolysis, for example, will differ depending on a couple of things. One, it depends on the enzyme's catalytic activity. If the enzymes have a high affinity for their substrate and they're very easily able to turn substrate into product, they have high catalytic activity, influx through that pathway will be fast. However, if that enzyme is inhibited by some type of competitive or non-competitive inhibitor or something like that, that will reduce the enzyme's catalytic activity and therefore reduce overall flux through the pathway. Metabolites will move slower through the pathway than they did before. This also depends on the needs of the cell. For example, if we've already oxidized a lot of glucose, to make ATP and the cell has all the ATP it needs, we need to find a way to slow down glycolysis so that instead of using that glucose, we store it for later. Flux of intermediates through a pathway also de depends on the concentration of intermediates in the pathway. Um, most of these are fairly constant because there's an equal rate of synthesis, so creation of these intermediates and breakdown, and so most of them exist at a steady state. Um, and so really the way that we alter flux through a metabolic pathway is mostly depending on what the cell needs. And so the energetic molecules themselves, ATP and so on, can control flux through the pathway. And then also the rate of the enzymes activity, particularly those far from equilibrium reaction enzymes. So these are the two major ways in which we can um, control flux through a pathway. What are some of the regulatory mechanisms that control metabolic flux? So I sort of mentioned them broadly, so let's get into some of these a little bit more closely. Again, one of the ways that we can control metabolic flux through a pathway is to regulate the catalytic activity of the far from equilibrium enzymes, the enzymes that catalyze those rate determining steps. This can be done through the use of competitors, um, like inhibitors, I'm sorry. So this can be done through the use of inhibitors. A lot of these enzymes, a lot of the metabolic enzymes are allosteric enzymes, where the active site can bind its substrate and turn into product, but there's another pocket on that enzyme called an allosteric site, which binds a regulatory protein. When an allosteric site is bound to its regulatory protein, that will change the shape of the active site and change the affinity of the enzyme for binding its substrate. Usually these metabolic enzymes are regulated by the products of the pathway itself. So for example, here's one example of this. This is called feedback inhibition, where enzyme one is the start of the pathway. It binds the first um, substrate to turn it into the first product. That product then becomes a substrate for enzyme two to create another product. And that then becomes substrate for enzyme three to form the final product. When enough of this final product is made and starts to increase in concentration, it will be able to bump into and bind this first enzyme 
And usually the product, if this is negative feedback inhibition, what happens is the product will bind the enzyme at enzyme one, and that will decrease its catalytic activity. And so therefore, flow through this pathway will decrease because the activity of this enzyme has decreased. <clears throat> this means if enzyme one is inhibited and decreased, this intermediate, <coughs> the concentration of this intermediate will decrease, and therefore um, enzyme two will have less to work on, this intermediate will decrease, and therefore the product will then decrease. As product starts to decrease, less of it's able to inhibit enzyme one, and so if that happens, enzyme one's allowed to resume its normal catalytic activity. So this is a constant flow and a constant balance between the inhibiting product and the enzyme that controls the rate of flow through the pathway. Another way to control flux through a metabolic pathway is through covalent modification. And this is usually by binding or breaking phosphate bonds or a bond between a phosphate group and the enzyme. For example, in this example that we see here, um, we have um, dephosphorylation by a phosphatase. So a phosphatase enzyme removes a phosphate group. And so here we have an active enzyme. It has a phosphate group attached to it. And a phosphatase enzyme, when it removes that phosphate, will render that enzyme inactive. And so again, this is, this is control of the far from equilibrium enzymes. If we can control their catabolic rate, we can control flux through the pathway. Sister enzyme called kinases will actually use phosphates from ATP as a source of phosphate specifically and phosphorylate enzymes in order to activate them. And so kinases add a phosphate group using ATP as a source. Phosphatases remove phosphate groups um, in order to inactivate their targets. And so we can control the catabolic rate of these enzymes through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Another way to regulate flux through a metabolic pathway is through genetic control, where we alter the rate of expression of the enzyme in the first place. So here's an example. Um, if, you, if a steroid hormone is present, usually steroid hormones tend to increase metabolism in a cell. How does that work? Well, steroid hormones are nonpolar, so they can migrate through the, enzyme, um, through the cell membrane layer, and they target a receptor on the inside of the cell. That hormone receptor complex will then enter the nucleus and bind to um, areas, of the DNA, uh, areas of DNA that regulate gene expression. And so let's say we need to increase a metabolic enzyme like this enzyme right here. We need, or let's say the first enzyme in glycolysis, hexokinase. Hexokinase enzyme, there's a gene that expresses it, that controls the, controls, um, the amount of how much of it's there. And so if we have this steroid hormone binding this receptor and this complex binds to the regulatory region of hexokinase, that will increase the rate of RNA made from that and therefore increase the rate of hexokinase production. More hexokinase, more flux through the pathway. There's more enzymes to bind substrate and you can increase the rate of the pathway. Okay, now let's talk about one last way that you can control metabolic flux, which is through a substrate cycle. This can get a little bit tricky to explain. So I'm gonna try and go through this slowly. In substrate cycles, what this means is usually a substrate cycle occurs when two metabolic pathways run simultaneously but in opposite directions. So what this means is this is one step in glycolysis. Glycolysis starts with glucose somewhere up here and ends with pyruvate down here. So glycolysis is moving in this direction. The opposite pathway is gluconeogenesis where we take pyruvate and use that to build and create glucose which would be back up here. And so gluconeogenesis is moving in this direction. Because fructose 6-phosphate, I'm sorry, no, that's a, that's a substrate. Um, because this kinase enzyme is a far from equilibrium enzyme, it is always saturated with fructose 6-phosphate and therefore will always catalyze the forward reaction towards fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So F6P binds to this enzyme. This enzyme is a far from equilibrium enzyme, so it's always saturated and will always move in this direction. And so that means this enzyme is incapable of catalyzing the reverse direction. This means we need another enzyme to do the reverse direction to kind of get around that. That's FBPase. 
this one is always saturated with its substrate, this product or this substrate right here, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and will always catalyze this reaction towards gluconeogenesis. All right, this means flux in one direction is controlled by flux in the other direction. So if flux through glycolysis is quick and PFK1 is working very quickly, that will actually decrease the rate of the opposite reaction. This is called a fetal cycle. Okay, and so that's what's being explained here. Glycolysis reaction is the catabolism of glucose. It requires the use of ATP to turn fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The gluconeogenesis reaction is the anabolism of glucose, taking glu fructose 1,6-bis, so this, and turning it into fructose 6-phosphate. If they both run simultaneously at equal rates, so let's say PFK1 and FBPase1 run at the same rate and catalyze their reactions at the same speed. This means we will use ATP to make F16BP, then when we use this to turn it right back into fructose 6-phosphate, this will bind here and turn it back. So we end up in what's called a fetal cycle if these two enzymes are reacting at the same rate. So this is called a fetal cycle or a substrate cycle. We need to avoid this. We need to stop this fetal cycle because what happens is, is we're using ATP with no real any product, right? We use ATP to make this, but it's immediately turned back into this. Okay, use ATP again to make this, it's immediately turned back into this. So we have these two enzymes working against each other, which means we need to regulate these enzymes in opposite ways. And so this is, this is how we control flux through substrate cycles. If PFK1 is working faster than this enzyme, then we will move towards glycolysis because this enzyme is able to do its reactions faster than this one. If this enzyme is working faster, then flux will move towards gluconeogenesis because this enzyme is able to work faster than this one. So in summary, the regulatory mechanisms that control metabolic flux are allosteric control, um, which is some type of product of the pathway will inhibit or increase the activity of an enzyme. Covalent control, in which we can phosphorylate or dephosphorylate an enzyme to change its catabolic rate. Or substrate cycle control, where we oppositely regulate enzymes doing the opposite activities. And so um, we can't have those two enzymes working against each other. One has to work faster than the other one. And then lastly, we also have a longer term method, which is genetic control, which is the use of increase or decreasing transcription of those enzymes in order to increase or decrease metabolic flux. These ones, allosteric, covalent, and substrate cycle control, respond within seconds or minutes in the cell. However, genetic control takes a lot longer to respond.